is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimere. A great inland sea is the focal point of the known world. All international travel and trade involves understanding of these waters, and the bounty of this great body of water sustains many nations more than the land. The great expanse of water might cover more space than the Mediterranean by a factor of almost 25 when accounting for the northern reaches beyond the known world, but with an average depth ranging between 20 and a couple hundred feet, it contains less volume. The shallowness of this great inland sea, coupled with minimal tide shifts, means that it is a stable habitat booming in biomass and biodiversity. Currents have carved channels up to a thousand feet in depth, and reefs make up some 10 to 15 percent of the sea floor. Islands are scattered throughout, in some places close enough that terrestrial fauna can reliably travel between the continents. The rest of this space, spanning some 15 million square miles, is the Great Seagrass Meadows. Called the prairie below the waves in the languages of the Kalin, most of the inland sea is shallow enough that seagrass can grow in abundance. This biome is present on Earth, typically thriving in coastal waters between 5 and 50 feet deep, especially near reefs or islands that break up waves. This context is common in the inland sea, and in turn the roots of seagrass help keep sediments stable, which aids in making more habitat for coral to grow on and preventing too much island erosion. While coral reefs are, as on Earth, one of the most productive habitats in Chimere, seagrass meadows of Earth are unsung sanctuaries of biodiversity, a truth which is amplified in Chimere. Seagrass evolved on Earth during the Cretaceous period. Although kelp and other analogous flora have been in Chimere for many millions of years, the species of seagrass which now dominates the inland sea can trace their origin to the harvest in the aftermath of the dynastic extinction. The nutrients of the volcanic ash coupled with an abundance of shallow seas was the perfect garden for these new plants to grow. It was not until Arvel closed the gaps of 8 million years ago, however, that the inland sea became its modern shelter, at which point the seagrass prairie really came into its own. On Earth, seagrass meadows are critical sanctuaries and nurseries for marine microfauna. Many crustaceans, fish, and cephalopods begin their life in these interconnected roots. While this is the case on Chimere, a combination of plentiful foliage and lots of islands to rest on has drawn an unprecedented number of megafauna. First of these were the Desmostylians and Cyrenians, two clades of herbivorous marine mammals which came from North America harvests that coincided with the spread of the meadows. I have covered the Cyrenians, or sea cows, in their own episode, which I am quite proud of and suggest you check it out. Desmostylians, however, have no such modern relatives. They were quite successful at marine mammals which looked quite a lot like a hippo but with broad feet. Some could swim, but most were dense like hippos and sank to the sea floor. Although being a marine mammal that is a poor swimmer might sound strange, it is actually quite efficient since the animal needs to spend no energy as it grazes on the sea floor. With their long tusks to uproot grass, powerful teeth to grind up even the toughest stems, and plenty of islands to rest on between feeding, Desmostylians rapidly took over this new habitat. The next harvest brought their first serious competition, sloths. Thalassochnus is a marine sloth found in Earth's Miocene of South America, and they route Thalassochnus is a marine sloth found in Earth's Miocene of South America, and they found rapid success in Chimere. Slower metabolisms meant they did not need as much food for their size, and this slight difference proved to be a substantial advantage over time. Thalassochnid sloths evolved into two clades, some swimmers and some bottom punters, and their success was so absolute that only two species of specialized Desmostylian persist in modern Chimere. Another clade of sloths, the Mylodonts, also presented their own seagrass grazer, which is survived by the Sakur, although the Thalassochnids outnumber them by a considerable margin. 
In fact, marine sloths of this clade are so successful that the inland sea is often called the Sloth Sea. I have an episode on sloths in the known world if you would like to know more. With such great bounty, it should come as no surprise that dinosaurs also experimented with this niche in a way that they never did on Earth. A genus of Theskelosaur took to the water around the time known sloths arrived, making use of their thick tails and strong kicks to gorge themselves on seagrass. While they did not find the degree of success as marine mammals, the Tagduru is still a specialist of the seagrass meadows, and their cousins are scattered throughout the wetlands of both continents and Picardia. The Mogao is a Dicynodont which came from a distant realm to the north. They are generalists, but a bulk of their diet is seagrass. From the far eastern continent comes one of the largest seagrass grazers. The Billaruk is a slow, armored multiturbiculate. The first specimens examined by naturalists of the Great Library were thought to have some sort of injury or deformity, but it is now known that the slight asymmetry in their skulls allows them to graze while keeping an eye out for predators. They are quite rare, but these slow-moving beasts lose very little energy as they graze, and they can hold their breath for over an hour, meaning they are well suited for this habitat. Sea turtles also round out the cast. While sloths, desmostylians, sirenians, dicynodonts, multituberculate, and thescalosaur have reached an understanding in terms of their food, on the beaches on which the sloths and dinosaurs must rest, a whole new sort of competition takes place. The plethora of crustaceans and mollusks in the seagrass meadows has drawn a range of gyrophagous animals as well. Walruses have the longest tenure and are indeed the most successful in modern chimere. Many small whales are also present, with some feeding on the surface while others sift through the seagrass for crustaceans. Seals and sea lions are also common, competing with the dolphins, sharks, and small mosasaurs for plentiful fish. This culminates in an intense competition between different species for prime island real estate. Fights for optimal beach space can get bloody, and the great claws of sloths and thescalosaurs are put to task against the tusks and bite of walruses and seals. It is worth the risk, however, to have a respite from the dangers lurking below the waves. With such a great diversity of marine herbivores and microfauna specialists, it should come as no surprise that the seagrass meadows have a diverse cast of predators. Mosasaurs, orcas, macroraptorial sperm whales, and even krakens stalk the prairies below the waves. The sea beavers are generalist predators, usually targeting crustaceans with their great shearing molars, but the larger species will hunt marine mammals up to twice their size. A particularly nasty bonito, called the Yakueco, is a predator which attacks with such blinding speed that it is known to sever limbs and heads on impact. While there are many shark species in the seagrass meadows, three are especially notable. Hemichrystis cera, the wolverine shark, is a giant species of weasel shark that came to Chimer with their favored Serenian prey during the Miocene. They have changed little in this time, and Serenians make up a vast majority of their diet, to the point that other marine mammals have little to fear from them. As ambush hunters, they often lie in wait until they get the opportunity to strike from below. Far more generalist is the panther shark, or Ulaneko. Naturalists of Balandukoi are unsure of their origins, but believe they are an Otodid, perhaps an early member of the genus Ototus itself, or some sister genus, which came to Chimer during the Tyrant Dynasty. They are voracious endothermic pursuit predators, and readily target the more dangerous sloths, walruses, and thescalosaurs. The sea hippo, the smaller of the Desmostylian species, is also on their menu, although they are entirely too small to try the mighty Bilgarobi. Ototus megalodon, the whaler shark, is by a wide margin the largest shark in Chimere, and indeed one of the largest organisms in the known world and beyond. 
The 60-foot Methuselahs cannot hunt in these shallow waters, but the inland sea does make an ideal nursery and training ground for these gods of the sea. Pregnant mothers will follow the current channels deep into the inland sea and give birth so their 4-meter newborns can make their first kills in easier hunting grounds than the open ocean. Whaler sharks are generalist apex predators who eat their way up the food chain, becoming regular hunters in the meadows for the first few years until graduating to the current channels where larger whales are in greater abundance. Eventually, after over 20 years that it takes for them to reach maturity, they will venture out into the open oceans where their true tests begin. Motomazor, another apex predator of the open ocean, will sometimes venture into the inland sea to feast on the abundance of marine mammals. More common, however, is their little cousin the Ganduru, which has a taste for seals, and the Kalutu, a relic of much more basal mosasaurs, which are generalists that will eat just about anything they can fit into their surprisingly elastic jaws. The Katabo is another mosasaur, sometimes spotted in the meadows, but these and other serpentine members of the clade are much more comfortable and common amongst reefs. While adult Motomazor and whaler sharks are thankfully incapable of making a long-term living in the meadows due to their size, the seagrass meadows are not without their predatory leviathans. Just as Thescalosaurs were drawn to the meadows to feed upon grass, so too were the Megaraptorans drawn to the sea in pursuit of the plentiful game. The Kurojaku is by a laughable margin the largest theropod ever to have evolved on Earth or Chimere. Females do not grow past 45 feet and some 15 tons, as they must still take to land to lay nests, but males have no such restrictions. Bulls routinely grow to lengths of 65 feet or 20 meters. The assembly has verified reports of 22 meter bulls, and the Picardian assert that one bull has taken up a residence in the Gulf of Iratame with a length of 25 meters, although this may be an error in estimation or exaggeration. While their size is certainly remarkable, it is the ecology of the Kurojaku which is perhaps most surprising. Despite a superficial resemblance to the now extinct Spinosaurs, Kurojaku are not fish specialists. In fact, marine mammals are their near-exclusive targets. They are notoriously terrible swimmers, with skin half a meter thick in parts, solid bones, and minimal air sacs, the Kurojaku will immediately sink if they are in open water. Furious kicks and strokes of their sculling tail can propel them for a little while, but they will swiftly be claimed by exhaustion. However, along the bottom of these vast meadows, the features which would make open water hunting impossible fall into place as boons. The great density keeps them amongst the grass, where long oily filaments allow them to blend in. When they spot prey, their legs, which are as short as possible to reduce drag without compromising their tail muscle attachments, kick them off, and with their powerful tails adding thrust, their charges can reach speeds of up to nearly 30 miles per hour in short bursts, and can maintain a steady jog for hours at a time. Their fins serve as a keel, keeping them stable and steady as they run along the substrate. Once they catch prey in their jaws, be it whale, sea cow, desmostylian, or sloth, they quickly take to thrusting their meter-long claws into vital organs, seeking to make them bleed out. Prey is then taken to shallower waters along islands for processing, either swallowing whole or butchering. Their lifestyle demands at least one large kill every few days, sometimes daily, but the great abundance of marine megafauna in their habitat means the Kurujaku can sustain themselves with large populations. The success of the Kurojaku, a predator that could only exist with great numbers and diversity of prey reliant upon the meadows, is a testament to the virility of this biome. On Earth, seagrass meadows are one of the most threatened biomes. These habitats, which are the beginning of countless species of critical fauna, are in many ways disappearing at a faster rate than coral reefs. Having visited a few myself, I can attest to their enchanting wonder, and their importance to our marine ecosystems doesn't get nearly the amount of conservation attention that they deserve. 
I highly recommend you check them out, and if you live near a seagrass meadow, I encourage you to check out some local conservation groups. They could always use some extra hands. Shout out to The Angry Optimist for sponsoring this episode. I've been looking forward to working on a series of biome studies, and as the dominant biome at the center of the map, the seagrass meadows was a perfect place to kick off. As you might expect, my latest anthology, Songs of the Inland Sea, has many stories set on or near the prairie below the waves. The six short stories and novellas in this anthology are my love letter to the sea, and I hope you might reach out to your local bookstore if you want to order a copy yourself or for someone you know. Supporting local businesses is super important, and you can also support yours truly while you're at it. Thank you so much to my Patreon patrons to your support, again to the Angry Optimist, and thank you for watching this episode. Cheers, folks!